Well, the Warriors are now 0-22 when they trail entering the fourth quarter. The Warriors, uh, I think, have the second worst road record in the NBA now. I'm going to have to confirm that. This is just embarrassing. And Jack Winter is going to join me. We might have an interesting debate because I am sick and tired of Anthony Lamb taking up important minutes. He was in the closing lineup two days ago. He wasn't even on the roster. Steve Kerr has lost his mind, in my humble opinion. Maybe Jack will have more sense than me. We'll find out. Locked on Warriors is next. You are Locked on Warriors, your daily Golden State Warriors podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Warriors your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get podcasts. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. You can follow Jack Winner. He's a, a Golden State Warriors beat reporter for Clutch Points on Twitter at Armstrong Winner. You can follow me, Cyrus Sauces, on Twitter at Dog Surf Roadshow. This was a colossally disappointing loss, in my <sighs> humble opinion, uh, they're playing an Atlanta Hawks team that I feel like if you're going to play a road game and and win it, this should be one of those games. The Hawks were a game below 500 entering tonight. Uh, the Warriors were two games above 500. They're now just one game above 500. They could be uh, they could drop to the ninth seed uh, when everything shakes out at the end of either today or tomorrow. Jack, your initial impression of this game. Why did the Golden State Warriors lose a game that I thought they should have won? Cyrus, great to be back. I wish it was under, uh, you know, we were in a better, better spirits here. And again, I'm not just, just for everyone listening. I'm not an actual Warriors fan. I just cover the team. But <laughs> just watching the game tonight, I was honestly just kind of disgusted from what we saw. Um, you know, there were some, the Warriors came out hot. They came out fighting really hard. I thought of the first five minutes, they built a double digit lead. Then once the bench came in, it just completely unraveled. The Hawks picked it up after Quinn Snyder called the timeout. Um, and, you know, the Warriors were really just never able to recover. They just never, never really found the string defensively. Offensively, I don't think they quite attacked Trey Young enough. And then if you only make, you know, what, what they go from three, 11 of 40 from three. And the Hawks, you know, who are not a great, great three-point shooting team, despite the fact that they have Trey, who's actually not a big volume guy from three. They right. go 16 of 41. That's a huge difference right there. And then when you, when you also get uh, scored 50-27 in bench points, it's just going to be really, really, really tough to win on the road, as well as when you turn it over seven more times than the Hawks do and the Hawks never turned over they came into this game with the second lowest turnover rate in the league so that shouldn't have been a surprise and a lot of these Warriors turnovers were just baffling and it, and it, mm -hmm. and it was happening it was happening all game um and you know what happened it happened down the stretch as well when uh you know right as the game was kind of sealed there when the Warriors kept targeting Trey Young late which I thought was great they finally they finally started going back to it in crunch time Agreed. Uh, after after really opening the game with it but then you know Trey just happened to rip Steph's dribble there and gave him a little wave for the for the game clinching layup and uh yeah the Warriors 10 straight road loss and 0-2 and on this pivotal road trip yeah, and and uh, one thing that completely blew my mind, I have to start with this, um, and you and I were having a, a healthy a debate before the, we hit the record button and the live button, which is that um, Anthony Lamb, who just literally a day ago was not even on this roster, he hadn't played the last few games because uh, Bob Myers, Joe Lacob um, did not want him on the roster. Uh, this is clearly Steve Kerr loves him. <clears throat> I don't get why. And I want to quickly read off the play-by-play for what happened down the stretch of this game uh, in the fourth quarter, because this was, I believe what it was like a one point game. Is, is that correct? Uh, uh, yeah. yeah right? Points. Yes. I think I believe it was 120, 119 at one point. Is that right? Yeah, here it is. Okay. So 120, 119, um, Anthony Lamb lost, uh, had a loose ball foul, right? Uh, so that made it from 121, 119 to 123, 119. Uh, then Stephen Curry had a turnover, which was one of the uncharacteristic things we were talking about. Um, and then uh, Trey Young made a, made a basket, made a 125, 119. And then finally, Jordan Poole, who, another player who you and I agree had an awful game tonight, uh, came in the game uh, at the 45 second mark when at that point this game was pretty much done. Um, and, and this goes back to the whole thing. This is my philosophy. All right. When it comes to judging individuals on a, on a team in a team game like basketball, um, the world championship is the hardest thing to attain. And it's also the number one goal in the NBA. It's the, it's the grand prize. It's damn difficult to attain. It's, it's, I, I, would, 
I would be curious to hear if someone uh, came up with something that's more difficult to achieve in the NBA than winning the world championship. Uh, the Golden State Warriors, I feel like in a lot of ways, have spoiled people uh, simply because they've done it four times in eight years and they made it look easy. It is not easy. There's only a handful of teams in this association's entire history who have won a world championship. There's a lot of teams that have never done it. So when the Warriors accomplished that last year, and anytime a team does accomplish it, I have a lot of leeway for the players on that team who, were, who helped make that happen, who were largely responsible for that. Jonathan Kaminga was on this team last year. He was playing important minutes in the NBA Finals. Moses Moody was on this team last year. He was playing important minutes in the Western Conference Finals. Both were starting games in the postseason. I understand the argument that they might have won without those two. I get it. But regardless, they were playing minutes. They won a championship together. And what does Steve Kerr do? The primary difference between last year's team and this year's team are extensive minutes being given to Anthony Lamb and Ty Drone wasn't in the game tonight, but Ty Drone, when he plays, gets a lot of minutes too. The only other player that is a difference maker in terms of minutes between last year and this year is Dante DiVincenzo. I think you're out of your mind if you're going to blame Dante DiVincenzo for the team's regression this year. Yeah. Anthony Lamb, in my humble opinion, a player who is 26 years old, a player who was undrafted, a player who was about to be out of this league altogether until Steve Kerr plucked him from obscurity and put him on this roster. He now has a guaranteed deal. He should not be in the game at the end when in a pivotal road game, as you're trying to develop and determine playoff positioning, you had Jermichael Green, a veteran of the NBA on the bench, who's six, I'm sorry, who's three inches taller than him, who I, regardless of, of his struggles in the night, at least defensively and at least with rebounding, and he's a stretch big. He can hit the three, even though he struggles sometimes. You had him as an option. You also had Jonathan Kaminga who only played 20 minutes. I read a stat on the last show that when Kaminga plays 25 or more minutes per game, the Warriors win since, since the new year. Since January 1st, they've won 71.4% of their games when he plays 25 or more minutes. That number almost reverses entirely when he plays 20 or less. It goes into the 40% uh, range. They win when Kaminga plays. Yet what does Steve Kerr do in tonight's game? He plays Kaminga a whopping total. Despite starting him, he plays him a whopping total of, what, 19 minutes, 20 I, minutes? So I actually, got, I actually got the box where it says Kaminga 26, plays 25-53. Yeah. yeah, okay. So regardless, why could he not finish the game? Like, why do you have to give the ball to Anthony? Why is, why is Anthony Lamb getting all these minutes? The reason why I'm critical of Anthony Lamb so much, it's not him personally. It's the, it's the fact that this team right now is 36 and 35 on the year. They're in danger of not even making the playoffs. He has not proven to me this late in the season. We're at the 71 game mark of the season, 71 games. That's enough of a sample size. 50 games ago was enough for me, but for the sake of argument, 71 games, I think is enough to make a determination for which players are bringing intangibles that result in winning and which players are not bringing those intangibles. Anthony Lamb does not translate to winning. We can have an argument about stats. We can have an argument about what he brings as a, as a, as a bigger body 6'5 individual. But the bottom line is they lose, they lose, they lose when he plays. He is not a proven winner. He's never done anything to show me that he's a winner. I don't understand what he's done to earn the trust of people given he was a, a new player on this team back in October. I don't understand why Kerr loves this guy. That is my rant. I'm just tired of seeing Anthony Lamb. The reason why I'm so opposed to him being on this roster is because Steve Kerr has like a love affair with him. Like if he's on the roster, Kerr will play him. So that so you saw what Bob Myers and Joe Lake were doing. They were doing everything in their power to keep him away from Kerr because they know Kerr incessantly keeps playing this guy for unnecessary reasons. Unfortunately, with Draymond's suspension, Andre Iguodala's injury, now you have to put him on the roster because you have no one else practically, but you still had Jermichael Green. You still had Jonathan Kaminga, and who knows what happens if they play. We'll never know now, but we do know what happened with Anthony Lamb playing. They lost another damn game. That's my rant, Jack. Your turn. Now, like you said, Sal, a lot of this is just subjective. I thought Anthony Lamb fought harder on the glass than Jonathan Kaminga did tonight. I think that's why Steve Kerr went to him late, um, as opposed to why he didn't go to, to go to Jermichael Green instead of, instead of Anthony Lamb. My guess is because... Anthony Lamb is a better switch defender on the likes of Trey Young and DeJounte Murray. He's also a better three-point shooter than Jermichael Green, and Jermichael Green was just getting absolutely roasted in both normal... Is that true in the last month, Jack? Uh, well, are we just basing things off the smallest sample size as possible? Is a month small? I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean is, is a month recent small. shooting number is not relevant? I mean, 
Because because Lamb spot. as a career shooter is 35. Like a lot of people, myself included, believe that his 40% number was an anomaly and that it's reverting now to his career average. So mm -hmm. I do think it is relevant to a certain extent that his career number is closer to 35 and he's now reverting to that with each game that passes. But go on. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, 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 no. You're fine. And I do want to say that I thought Anthony Lamb actually did some good things right when he came in the game with 317 left. And defense certainly wasn't the problem for the Warriors um, either. I think the Hawks actually just scored three points before Trey had that that steal and then leak out layup to kind of clinch the game. So there was like a two and a half minute span there where the Hawks just had three points, I believe all free throws. Um, so they didn't, they didn't have a field goal actually. I believe it was from 508 until that, uh, until that Trey, Trey leak out um, and steal. So I thought, I thought Anthony Lamb actually did some pretty good things when he came in. He hit Steph Curry going back door. Steph missed a tough, tough kind of finger roll over Clint Capella. And then Lamb fought really hard for an offensive rebound, got on the floor, won a jump ball and then uh, tipped it to Steph and Clay, Clay missed an open three. That type of stuff will happen, obviously. And like, I, like, are you singing the same tune about Anthony Lamb? If say Clay hits that three, and the Warriors and the Warriors go up one or two there and go on to I, win. My, my, all I care about, bottom line, is wins and losses. And and when certain players don't deliver in terms of the win category, yeah, I do think like you have to kind of change things up. Like Anthony Lamb is not resulting in this team winning games. For people out here that are that are uh, expressing different opinions, why do you not care that this team's losing night after night? You know, like the the well, one variable that is different between last year and this year is Anthony Lamb. Is that not a fact? Well, and no Gary Payton, no Otto Porter, Andrew Wiggins has missed, you know, he's two separate stints missing a month. But that wasn't like for the whole year. No, no Andre you know? Iguodala. You know, that's, that's not, that's not the only difference. Jordan Poole isn't the same player he was last year. You're right. Um, he's scoring more and he has more assists actually. And, and he's I'm less, he's less efficient, struggling from three. And he's shooting, arguably, shooting. he's arguably the worst rotational defender in the NBA. I thought he was just horrible defensively tonight, like to the point of not caring. Fair. Um, you know, there, there were, there were so many times where he was just standing straight up, dying on screens, going under flare screens, getting wrong footed in pick and roll action. The Hawks relentlessly targeted him in pick and roll, getting him switched on to Trey. Yeah. Dante. He did not do well at all. Steve Kerr obviously knew it. He had a really quick leash for him tonight, which I thought he needed. Yeah. Like we, like we discussed side before the show started, Jordan Poole did really come alive offensively there late in the third quarter. He had a step back three, had a filthy kind of finish uh, after a slick dribble move and then hit yep. that nasty, just like fading almost out of bounds corner three off an awesome cross court bounce pass from Dante DiVincenzo. But uh, Jordan Poole gave up points on the other end, like each each of like during that entire sequence, they were targeting him and he was giving up points. Um, you know, yeah. It was, no, and he also, but he also saw his minutes go down as a result of that. He only played 23 yeah. minutes in tonight's game. Rightfully um, so. Yeah, rightfully so. I agree. Yeah, Jordan Poole was awful. We'll go, there, there's something to talk about with Poole as well. We'll come back in just a minute. I have to give a, yeah. do an ad read here real quick uh, and talk about our first sponsor, ooh, which is Nissan. Um, and more specifically, the Nissan Aria, which is their new electric vehicle. Um, and so each week we present the Nissan Nissan's most electric player of the week, um, which is brought to you again by the all new, all electric 2023 Nissan Aria. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot, Jack. If you had to pick uh, a one player from the Warriors roster from this last week as being the most electric, the most brilliantly fierce, uh, who might be uh, categorized as stunningly powerful, as elegantly powerful, who would you classify? I'm still I'm, I'm still giddy off Steph's 50 burger in that loss. Go. One of the most jaw dropping performances I've ever seen from anyone, uh, let alone Steph. So that's I'll give it to Steph. Fair enough. Yeah, you can't go wrong with that. And and so Stephen Curry is this week's uh, <clears throat> electric player of the week. Um, and just to let you know, again, the 2023 Nissan Aria packs pin you to your seat power. And we also have a graphic that I forgot to. Uh, and still here real quick, courtesy of the Nissan Aria. There we go. Better late than never. Uh, it's the, the all new, all electric 2023 Nissan Aria, the electric vehicle for people who love to drive. Shop now at NissanUSA.com. You are Locked On Warriors, your daily Golden State Warriors podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Warriors your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get podcasts. Let me get that Nissan graphic out. By the way, of all the chat people, there's a few regulars that are emerging here. Um, and one person that I always seem to agree with is Joe. Um, you know your stuff. And I agree with you, Joe. You wrote, if Lamb is playing this much, the season is over. I totally agree. I want to add one more chat. Uh, anyone with eyes can see how Lamb and Jerome get abused defensively 24-7. 
And this is, and that's an, a huge point is that Anthony Lamb, he's 6'5. So when the other team has guys 6'8, 6'9, 7'1, like Clint Capella, how is a 6'5 guy with an average wingspan going to stop that? That's a massive liability. Like, yes, he grabbed an offensive rebound late in the game. But again, in 20, let me look at the box score here again, real quick. So I have the final one in front of me now. In 23, 21 minutes and 22 seconds of play, if I have the right box score here, uh, eight points. Do I have the right one? Yeah. Eight yeah. points, five rebounds, one assist, minus 11 and the plus minus. Tied for the worst on the team. Yet you defend him. Why? Well, it's moot. If Draymond Green isn't suspended, if if Andrew Wiggins is healthy, if Andre Wadal is healthy, if Gary Payton is healthy. Let's, let's yeah. say the reality. Let's say on like they didn't have him. You're right. So why is Lamb, yeah. despite those numbers that I just read you, despite the fact that he's 6'5", being playing over Jermichael Green, a 32-year-old veteran who the team went out and got in the buyout market, over Jonathan Kuminga, a, a player that, again, I just mentioned, when he plays 25 more minutes per game, the team usually wins, and he's right at that 25-minute cusp. He should have been at the end. I don't know why. What, what is the justification for playing Anthony Lamb over to Michael Green, who played nine minutes less or eight minutes less, uh, didn't have like a horrible game. He was two for three from the field, six points, uh, three rebounds. Again, he played eight minutes less. Uh, uh, Jonathan Kaminga, 25 minutes, 10 points. Not bad on the rebounding side of things. He struggles there sometimes. Got grabbed six boards. Um, why? Why is Anthony Lamb playing over Kaminga and Jermichael Green? Well, Jermichael Green didn't play a single minute at the four in this game. He was playing. He was only coming in for looning. So I would imagine that has something to do with it. If Kerr is uncomfortable playing Jermichael Green at the four, I am. Um, you could say you could make an argument that he may be better than Anthony Lamb. There, obviously, there, uh, Cyrus. You may think so. Some of our some of our listeners may think so. Um, but as I said, I think he's a better switch defender than Anthony Lamb. Um, I think he's a better shooter than. Or I'm sorry. I think I think Lamb is a better is a better shooter than Jermichael Green. I think he's a better switch defender. And then as far as Kaminga goes, I thought Kaminga looked a little frazzled. There was that one possession late where he kind of caught going back door on DeAndre Hunter, put his back to the rim and tried to dribble five or six times and almost tried to ISO there in a crucial late game situation. Almost had the ball knocked off him. Um, maybe that had something to do with it, but I, but I honestly just think as far as, uh, as far as Lamb over Kaminga, it just has to do with the fact that I thought Lamb was fighting harder on the glass than Kaminga was. Um, especially in those first few minutes, those first couple of minutes of crunch time when, when the Hawks are just getting whatever they wanted uh, on the offensive glass. Again, that's, you can, it's subjective obviously, but so is the notion that Jonathan Kaminga and Jermichael Green would be much better than Anthony Lamb in that instance. And again, I don't think Anthony, like, I just think it's ridiculous to, to focus on Anthony Lamb so much when again, the Warriors are missing two of their four best players two of their top three players uh and i and again i think jordan Poole is the real problem here um I well the I, reason why i keep bringing him up is because because i, I there's only five guys on the court yeah. the closing lineup to me re represents the most important players on your roster it is not who starts it's who finishes and the fact that kerr is going to him this is just it's just symbolic of what of the madness that kerr is doing this whole season where you have better players on your roster but because kerr is comfortable with certain people and these same people are not resulting in wins jack the team is 36 and 35 and he's just doing this over and over again the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over expecting different different results you're not going to get this a different result if you keep playing him like i guess i guess at one point is he ever going to come to the realization that playing these two-way guys is not going to result in victories or are we just going to be hearing for the rest of eternity lines like what you just said which is well, you know, like he's a better option than someone else. Well, they still lost. Isn't the whole, isn't the entire goal winning? But again, I mean, the, 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 the biggest reason they lost is because Draymond Green was suspended. Andrew Wiggins is out. Gary Payton II is hurt. And Andre, unfortunately, is probably out for the rest of the season. They were, but they were within two. They were within two with a minute to play, Jack. They could have won this game. And yeah. with Anthony Lamb well, in would there, you, that would you, have, would you have had them put Jordan Poole on the floor and get in just and, and have the, no, and have the I already said what I want. I wanted because if Jordan Poole is even a passable defender, then perhaps he could be in that close. I never said that. I never said that. I said I wanted either Jonathan Kaminga or Jermichael Green, two players mm -hmm. who are three inches to four inches in height who can actually play better defense. I don't buy into this notion that Anthony Lamb is a better switch defender. I don't. I, let, I that is the definition of I think, he's a, I, think he's much, I think he's a much better switch defender than Jermichael Green. Certainly not Kuminga. I mean, Kuminga is obviously near, a near lockdown, near lockdown guy one on one. Yeah, and I just, yeah, I, I just, I just don't get it. I just, you know, I, I, it would be like again if there were winning games with this strategy, I would not be sitting here complaining about it. But they're not winning. Jordan Poole, who a lot of people want to totally point a finger to, he gets leeway from me because he was the sixth man on a world championship team. 
And we'll, we'll talk about him more in just a minute. And this, I think a lot of uh, pools issues. And again, for the people you're saying like, like, uh, I, I don't get it. Like, do the people here who don't mind the lamb thing, do you just not care that the Warriors are losing time and time and again? Because the only consistent thing between last year and this year, the, in terms of differences, you're right. There's injuries as well. There are players missing. But the Warriors also have a lot of the same players. Like tonight, for example, in that closing rotation, they could have had Kaminga, who was on the World Championship team last year. Dante DiVincenzo belongs because he's just a damn good player. And sadly, the Warriors are going to lose him after this year. Yeah. Stephen Curry was out there. Hall of Famer, one of the greatest ever. Clay Thompson was out there. Hall of Famer, one of the greatest ever. And, and then Kabon Looney. You're not going to take him out. He's, a, he's one of the best rebounders in the whole game. So that intangible, the, 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 it's that fifth spot. You could have had someone in there who has world championship winning experience playing for you, or you go with the unproven player who, according to you and according to Kerr, is a better switch defender. Well, I don't see that resulting in victories. And that is the core difference between last year and this year is that one individual. And again, if they weren't the worst team or one of the worst road teams in the NBA this year, I, I haven't looked at the standings yet. Are they the second worst now? They're seven and twenty-eight. They might uh, as well be the worst because it's it's either the Rockets or the Spurs who have the who have a worse road record than they do. And uh, you know, they're obviously those teams are obviously tanking and the Warriors are going for a fifth championship in 10 years. So yeah, they're half a game ahead of the Rockets, uh, a game ahead of the Spurs for the worst road record. Yikes. That's just embarrassing, man. That is just embarrassing. But, I, but, I, but what you seem to see, what you seem to be suggesting is that it all comes down to Anthony Lamb getting 18 to 22 minutes a game, which to me just doesn't make any sense. Like, is Anthony Lamb solely responsible for the Warriors having the second to worst uh, road defensive efficiency in the NBA? Is he solely responsible for them allowing you know 40 percent three point shooting on the road or whatever? Or whatever? Well, that's like, part of it. He he wasn't helping with the with the perimeter defense. I mean, you you talk about him being a, this this outstanding switch defender. I did not say that. I did not say that. Okay, you did not say that he's a solid switch defender. <laughs> no, I did not say he was an outstanding switch defender. I'd say he's okay. A, I'd say well, he's I thought a, you said okay. So you just said he was a better switch defender than Jermichael Green. Is that what you said? Green, well, yes. He, my Michael. problem is he's getting. If he was getting five to ten minutes a night, my mouth would be shut. Twenty-one minutes, twenty-two seconds. Who, who, think of who else could be getting those minutes? Like last year, right? Every time I go back to the history books so a year ago and look at who was getting the minutes that Anthony Lamb is getting now. It was Andre Iguodala for the first half of the season before he turned into old man Withers and we never saw him again. And then the second half of the season, it was Otto Porter Jr., Gary Payne the second, right? Anthony Lamb does not sniff their jockstrap. You've got to do better. Jonathan Kaminga was supposed to be one of the guys that steps in and replaces him. Jermichael Green, at 32 years old, 6'8", 6'9", he at least can give you size. So at least he can intimidate uh, opposing players who are attacking the paint. Anthony Lamb does not put fear in anyone. If they attack the rim, they see a guy who's six, five and they're like, I can just do a hook shot. I can just stand here and just shoot. No problem because they have no fear of getting blocked. That's a fact. If you want to talk about facts, I mean, we're barely, nobody in here is really saying facts that much other than the fact that they lost tonight. And those 21 minutes and change are going to a player that I don't think should be on a world championship contending team. Um, we will, uh, <clears throat> and Showboy, and to anyone else, do not tell me what I should and should say on this show. Okay. I'm, Seriously, man, are you, you're welcome to express opinions about the team. You're welcome to say, I disagree, but do not dictate what I should and should not be talking about on the show. You're blocked. You're out. If you, if you bring that here, um, uh, when we come back though, let's talk about Jordan Poole because, uh, he, you're right. He was awful, but there's a lot of stats that show Steve Kerr, in my opinion, is not using him right. Um, and I'll explain that in just a moment after I go to our other ad for Friday, which is better help which I feel like I need more than ever right now, given the way the Warriors are making me feel. Who is your team, by the way, Jack? Someone asked that in the chat. Who is your favorite team? Yeah, I grew up in the Midwest in Kansas City, so I don't have a team, I'm afraid. <laughs> I, just, I, just, I just grew up following individual players, Kevin Garnett, Tracy McGrady, guys like that. I'm, I'm, I'm that age. Are you, are, you of the, are you of the pro Tracy McGrady Hall of Fame camp or anti? How could you be anti? <laughs> <laughs> Well, All right, fair enough, fair well, enough. What must that be like? My God. Well, I mean, the anti, a lot of people argue that Trace McGrady, by being admitted, kind of opened the door for like lower tiers of players who maybe never uh, accomplished postseason success. Because Trace McGrady was not Joe Johnson. He's, he's no. Tracy McGrady. I mean, right. <laughs> fair enough. Um, well, regardless, uh, this show, today's episode is brought to you, uh, sponsored by BetterHelp. And BetterHelp, again, it's all, look, this world is hard. Um, we're all going losing our minds sometimes. It's things are rarely easy. Uh, we're all undergoing stress that might cause anxiety that just might cause flat out mental illness. Um, whatever the case may be, there's there are resources out there for you. And one of those 
is BetterHelp. And this episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Give online therapy a try at betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA and get your way to being your best self. Um, look, if you've benefited from therapy, uh, you know, like, you know how important therapy is. I have, I don't know, Jack, I won't speak on your behalf, obviously, for this topic. Um, but pro regardless, I, very pro, very pro same, therapy. Therapy is, it, was awesome for me and when I really needed it. There you go. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm huge on that as well in, in terms of especially fighting against any stigmas that mm -hmm. pertain to, to, to mental health and to, to seek out help. Um, I think it's very important. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA today to get 10% off your first month and get the help that you might need. There's nothing wrong with getting help, especially given just how hard everything is in this world. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P.com slash LockedOnNBA. NBA. You are Locked On Warriors, your daily Golden State Warriors podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Warriors your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get podcasts. You can follow Jack Winter, Golden State Warriors beat reporter, covering, obviously, the Golden State Warriors for Clutch Points at Armstrong Winter. Uh, and you can follow me, Cyrus Otzes, on Twitter at Dog Surf Roadshow. Um, let's talk about Jordan Poole real quick. No. Uh, who, again, did not have a good game. He only had two points at the half. Um, he also had two turnovers at the half. Uh, but one thing that I want to point out, um, which is uh, which is why I think Kerr has some responsibility here to figure things out is the splits between home and road in terms of how Jordan Poole plays. Uh, not, I'm sorry, not home and road, starting versus the bench. So when Jordan Poole is a starter, he averages 24.4 points per game, 4.6 assists a game, and 3 point rebounds, 3.1 rebounds per game. Let me repeat that one more time. When Jordan Poole starts, he's averaging 24.4 points per game. Okay? That's, you're not a slouch if you're scoring that much. 4.6 assists, solid number. 3.1 rebounds for a guy 6'4, fine. When he's on the road, when he's, I'm sorry, when he's coming off the bench though, like he did tonight, his scoring almost drops by 10 points. He's averaging 14.7 points per game. He's averaging 4.5 assists, which is almost the exact same. But then he's averaging 2.2 rebounds per game. So when he comes off the bench, he averages one less rebound per game and he averages nearly 10 points per game less than when he starts. So if Kerr doesn't do something about this, okay, now a lot of people might say, well, Jordan Poole should take personal accountability for the way he plays, right? He's mm -hmm. awful defensively this year. There's no debating that. Um, but as an offensive player, there have been a lot of regressions. You talk about efficiency, and that, that applies specifically to shooting, right? His free throw percentage even is down by like five percentage points. His, his, his three-point shooting is down by over three percentage points, and that correlates to his overall field goal percentage. Um, but when he starts... He actually excels. So you're right. He had an awful game tonight. I, there's no sugarcoating it. Uh, his final box score tonight, by the way, uh, was a whopping total of uh, 12 points, had four assists, uh, two rebounds, shot only four for 12 from the field. That's 33%. That is not a good field goal percentage. He only shot two for eight from three. Uh, that's 25%. That is not a good three-point shooting percentage in 23 minutes of play. What, do you, what would you do if you were the head coach of the Warriors, Jack? What would you do with this Jordan Poole situation? Because as long as you bring him off the bench, he's not going to he's not going to perform. So what do you do? What are your thoughts? Well, I'd like to know the numbers uh, for Jordan Poole when he's starting in the same backcourt as Steph Curry versus when he's starting when Steph is out. I would mm. imagine that his numbers are a lot better when Steph is out. I'd imagine he's more efficient. Um, you know, it's and you know, you mean what Steph's in? You mean right? No, actually, I mean, I, I would I would honestly just assume just based on the eye test that I, I would think that Jordan Poole is a little more efficient and a little more productive when he's not starting when Steph is starting. So when he's when he's playing as a starter and Steph has been sidelined by injury, just because then you know that he's the Warriors primary ball handler. He can play with more freedom. He doesn't have to pick his spots. He doesn't have to worry about, you know, hitting Steph Curry going back door. He doesn't have to worry about screening for Steph Curry. He can really, really be the focal point. You know, like Jordan Poole, as we know, is at his best when he's playing aggressive and he's playing free with a a little bit of control and that's what Steve Kerr is trying to wrest from him and it's just been really difficult one of the this season has just been really difficult one of the things that I think uh, or one of the changes Kerr made earlier this season that I actually thought really made a difference for Poole I think it was around late November early December 
Um, when This was when Poole was still coming off the bench. He hadn't been inserted in the starting lineup yet. When Steve Kerr made the decision to put Draymond Green in with that second unit so Poole could have another reliable ball handler next to him. He was, Kerr even put Andrew Wiggins in that second unit when the Warriors were at full strength. And again, just to, just to give Poole some more support offensively so you can still allow him to be aggressive yet not have to uh, you know create so many shots for his teammates. So <clears throat> as far as starting Poole, I think it's a slippery slope just because I don't know if you want to start Steph Curry and Jordan Poole in the same backcourt, just because then you have two targetable defenders. Obviously, Steph is a much, much better defender than Poole. Um, you know, he's not, Steph isn't, isn't even a negative at this point in his career. He's just a guard, and guards get targeted by, uh, you know, by great players. That's what happens. Um, so, no, I wouldn't start Jordan Poole. Um, and, you know, what I do when the Warriors are healthy is I just, is I just try and go back to, you know, try and go back to that second unit to start second and fourth quarters. Um, where you have Jordan Poole surrounded by Andrew Wiggins, surrounded by Draymond Green, Dante DiVincenzo, and then whoever you want that fifth guy to be, maybe Jonathan Kaminga. Um, that's what I would do. That's what I would do. But it, it obviously is an issue. Jordan Poole is not the yeah. same player when he's coming off the bench versus starting. Um, and, you know, and, and unfortunately, just the, with the Warriors roster construction, I'm just not sure what you want to do about it. Because, again, starting two small guards like that is tough. And I don't have the numbers in front of me. I'll have to look them up after this. But I do wonder, um, you know, what Jordan Poole's production and efficiency is like when he is and isn't sharing the floor with Steph Curry. Yeah, I, I mean, it would take me a little while to find that. I can't do that during a live show. But um, yeah, for sure. The, the, the one thing that's weird, though, is at least based off memory, when we go back a year ago, Jordan Poole was starting in the backcourt with Stephen Curry uh, when the Warriors had that 18 and two start last year. Mm -hmm. And he was, he was playing great. Uh, and he finished this last season, averaging a little over 18 points per game. And then at the end of the season, because when Clay Thompson came back in January, uh, Poole went to the bench. I don't remember this level of regression though. Like when he went to the bench and then, and then he was back in the starting lineup the last month uh, when Stephen Curry had the knee, knee injury going into the playoffs. And, and for people that uh, may have forgotten, Remember, Steph came off the bench to start the, the first round against the Nuggets until the, the closing game, uh, the closeout game. Um, and regardless, he was fine. Um, oh, Poole was I, awesome I, in the playoffs coming off the bench. That's what's so weird about it. I mean, he shot something crazy like 64% on twos. In the play. I have that number seared in my brain. I guess not, not quite seared enough because I don't know it exactly. But it's something like 63 64% 64 on twos in the playoffs versus defenses like the Boston Celtics. Um, you know, that's just an incredibly impressive number. And Jordan Poole just hasn't been the same offensive player, let alone defensive player this season. Yeah, it, it's it's just I, I hope I hope they figure that out. Here's the one idea I've had, Jack. Um, and let me know if you agree or disagree. And this is not a position. I'm. This is not a strong position that I'm going to sit here and fight for. Um, I, I'm a believer strongly in mixing things up and changing things if it's broke. If it ain't broke, don't mess with it, right? And that's that's one of the many reasons why I'm baffled in, in terms of why Kerr has just backtracked on Moody and Kaminga. You know, they, they were they were. I don't get it. I don't get it. I, I wish they had the run. I thought Moody actually played played fine tonight. Fine. Um, but I believe strongly in troubleshooting if things aren't working. Um, and so when I see the Jordan Poole situation, and I'm thinking to myself, you got to do something. You got to like mix something up here because if you just keep doing this, if you just keep bringing them off the bench, unless you unless some other sorts of uh, forms of change uh, go along with it, I don't know how this is going to get resolved. One idea I had, and, and and people think I'm crazy when I bring this up. I get it, but uh, this is not a slight towards Clay Thompson at all. I, I keep mentioning Manu Ginobili. No one thought it was a slight to Manu when he was coming off the bench. Future Hall of Famer. The Spurs routinely close games with their big three of Ginobili, Tony Parker, and Tim Duncan. Just because he came off the bench does not mean it was a slight or a sign of disrespect. It just was the lineup that was optimal. And part of me wonders... If maybe you should bring Clay off the bench. Uh, and by the way, Clay did not, second game in a row, he did not play well. Uh, he had that brutal turnover at the end there, um, which was really just the backbreaker. I, th I thought that was like the game was over after that. Um, and Clay tonight, real fast, uh, just to read off the stat line, uh, he finished the game with 15 points. Second game in a row, he finished under 20. I think he had 11 last game, or uh, 15 last game, too, if I'm not mistaken. Um, six for 14 from the field, just two for seven from three. Grabbed 11 rebounds, so I, which may or may not help. Did not help tonight. Uh, added five assists. Um, I don't know. That's the only thing I could think of. And again, six turnovers for Clay tonight is the is the really important number. Six for Steph as well. Say again, which one? Six turnovers for Clay tonight. Yeah, and six, six for six, six yeah, for yeah, Steph you, as well. Those are the big numbers. Steph didn't have a great game, even though he scored. So, so, but what, real quick, what are your thoughts though on the possibility? I mean, it's just an idea. I'm not sitting here you know, advocating yeah. for it. I'm just, it's just an idea. 
that I no, don't yeah. would, would be the worst thing ever is bringing Clay off the bench. So you have Jordan Poole starting. Again, you could still give Clay his 35 uh, minutes per night. Your thoughts? Is that a bad idea? Is that something you would at least explore? What do you think about that? I think Clay is a little too proud for it. Would be my guess. Um, you know, I don't. I don't know Clay personally. I've talked. I've interviewed him. You know, and you know, in the, you know the setting everyone knows. But um, my guess would be that Clay is a little too proud for that. But say say he wasn't. Again, I would still be worried by starting both Poole and Curry. You know, against elite opponents. Say when you get to the playoffs, it just seems like a recipe for, uh, for disaster for me. Unless potentially you are playing Andrew Wiggins, Draymond Green, and Kevon Looney three borderline elite defenders. Draymond's definitely an elite defender. Right. Um, a- alongside them, then that's potentially a winning combination, right? You have three awesome defenders alongside your two small guards, one of which is actually like a good defender. And then one of which, as we've discussed, is imminently exploitable. Um, so, you know, again, it's not my favorite thing. And, the, you know, you know, the Warriors, Steve Kerr tried uh, putting putting Jordan Poole in the starting lineup this year. There was that eight or nine game stretch. I think it was began with the Boston game. I think it was, was a small was, ball lineup. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah right, right. Um, you know, st- starting work. great center. Yeah, it just didn't quite work. And then after, you know, a couple of weeks, uh, you know, Kerr said they were going back to a more traditional starting five with Loon in there for Poole. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, again, just defensively, I think I think it would lead to some problems, especially as the Warriors are currently constructed. It's certainly nothing you can do with Dante DiVincenzo starting at, you know, nominal small forward just because then you'd be so so small and you know the Warriors are already small with Dre and uh, Kevon Looney inside so it's nothing I would do um, but I do think you the Warriors have to find a way to get Jordan Poole going and really just get his confidence and his energy and his spirit back up because right now we are just not seeing it um, he just yeah. looked asleep out there tonight to me um, on both ends um, mostly defensively um, you know where I just thought he he was really he was really just emblematic of of kind of the Warriors lethargy lethargy all night um, I, just, I just did not think he was as, as engaged as he needs to be when you're, you know, trying not to lose your 10th road game in a row in the thick of a playoff race. It was just, yep. it just, it just frankly wasn't good enough. Um, you know, yeah, the Warriors need to figure it out. Um, do you, are you in a rush? Like, do you have, do you have time to make this a two part show or do you got to go? No, let's do it. All right, man. Let's, uh, let's do a part two folks. We're going to make this an extended uh, episode just because there's so much to talk about and 30 minutes is not enough. So um, here is part two. Let's do it. And the cool thing is we have less ads, I think. So that's going to be a perk. Here we go. (laughs)